All right, in the second video for matched or paired samples, we're going to do two more problems. One of them where we're going to choose to go for a left tail test where most of our numbers are negative or our differences are negative. And in the next problem, we're actually gonna have to perform an outlier check because we can't necessarily assume normality. So here we have a study conducted to investigate the effectiveness of hypnotism in reducing pain. So there's randomly selected subjects in this table of their pain significance level before and after, and the lower score indicates less pain. So the differences have a normal distribution, which is good. We don't need to worry about an outlier check then. And then what we're gonna do is ask, are the sensory measurements are on average lower after hypnotism? And generally what happens when people see the word lower they immediately lock on to less than. So therefore our null and our alternative hypotheses are given with the mu sub d, or the differences will be negligible or near zero. And here we have our mu sub d is less than zero. So this is a left tail test, which means we wanna take our primarily small numbers and then subtract them from the big numbers so most of them are negative. So in this case, if we take a look at our before numbers, okay, we got some numbers between, looks like 6.3 and 11.3, and then we look at the after numbers here, which is the, uh, looks like we got as small as 2.4 and as big as maybe 8.5, so it looks like our smaller numbers are the after numbers, so the after numbers here, the after minus before. Okay, so the after minus before. So we're gonna have our null and our alternative. Now, as you saw that um, in the previous video to this one, my step zero was figuring out my null and alternative, and then in step one was the order of subtraction. You can kind of flip-flop these two if you'd like to. You're not really set in stone in the way that you have to do these. Although, on the uh, test, I'll have spots for your null and alternative and scrap work wherever you want to put it. So let's do our subtraction, and let's do it very carefully here. So if we go after minus before, uh, this one's going to be positive, 0.2. And if we go after minus before, this one's going to be negative 4.1. This one here is going to be negative 1.6. After minus before is negative 1.8. After minus before, this is going to be negative 3.2. So you see that most of my values here are negative. So since they're more um, negative than positive, we're definitely going to have a left tail here. Um, so the next one we're going to do is 6.1 minus 8.1, so this is a negative 2. This table's pretty small, so that's why I'm kind of staggering my numbers here. 3.4 minus 6.3 is negative 2.9, and then 2.0 minus 11.6 is negative 9.6. Okay, so all, most all of these are negative, and that's really good. Even the non-negative one is pretty close. So this looks like it is going to be less than zero pretty strongly, but is it strong enough to, you know, reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference? Um, so step two, um, we're definitely looking at our, um, our group here, and since normal, you know, we don't have to no outlier check because our sample is definitely, your sample size is definitely under 30 in this case, but we can uh, assume normality because it said so in the problem itself. Okay, step three, four, and five are all gonna be done on the calculator. And we're gonna do that after we go to our calculator and we click it on and type the differences into list one. So clear out your list one and put down your point two your negative, and be sure to use the negative key by the decimal point here, negative 4.1, negative 1.6, negative 1.8, negative 3.2, negative 2, negative 2.9, 
and then finally negative 9.6. It's always good to go back and check your data just to make sure you typed everything in correctly. Okay, looks good. And now I'm gonna go with stat. I'm gonna go to the tests menu. And even though this is considered in our two sample chapter, we're gonna go to the one sample T test. Okay, in the one sample T test, we are in the data list. And our null hypothesis is gonna be set equal to zero. And our list is in list one, and we want one, and we're gonna go with less than. And let's uh, draw this out. We should have a left tail test and a very, very low Z-score. So low as you can barely see the shaded zone on the left there. You can kind of see it if you squint, but it's definitely shaded there because we are a Z-value that is negative 3.0359, and the P-value is very small, 0 0.0095, almost 1%. And that looks really good for my rejection of the null hypothesis. So let's just color our little itty bitty shaded section there and we're gonna plant our flag at negative 3.0359, which puts us three standard deviations below that zero norm here. And that is gonna tell me, ladies and gentlemen, that we are going to be rejecting. And we're gonna reject it because our p-value is less than our alpha. Our alpha could have been 1%, and this is definitely lower than 1%, even though the given alpha was 5%. So our P0095 is less than 5%. So therefore, since this is the inequality you need, the P is less than alpha, we have sufficient evidence. We have sufficient evidence that we reject the null hypothesis. So we reject the null hypothesis because the chance of us getting this rare event was so low, lower than our chance of alpha. So this is why we reject. All right, now this last problem here, it is another, um, you know, it doesn't say before and after. There's a lot of twists in this last problem, which is which is why I really am excited to do it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. We got we got some eighth grader seventh. Yeah, we got eighth graders here and they want to see how far they could do a shot put with their dominant and their weaker hand. They thought they could push equal distances with either hand. OK, so that kind of sets up your null and alternative hypothesis right here. OK, your null hypothesis is going to be that the differences are zero, and your alternative is going to be where the dis the differences are not zero. Because it says they thought they could push equal distances with their data, with their hand, and the data was collected and recorded in this table. So this is cool because the subtraction, the order doesn't matter here. So what you'll do is just decide to subtract the first, like well, this first list by the second list, and that's kind of neat. Um, what I want to show you, though, is I want to show you a way that you can do this all on the calculator instead of subtracting manually. And again, you can subtract one way or the other, but let's go to hit enter here. Now, to clear out this list, we're going to go up and we're going to hit clear. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want you to move to list two. And what I want you to do is I want you to put the data in list two. So now which data do I want to put in list two? Let's do the dominant hand in list two. So 30, 26, 34, 17, 19, 26, and 20. Oops, I've got to make sure my 19 shows up there. Oh, accidentally clicked the wrong button there. Let me hit clear. And let me make that one into a 19 there. It should be a 19. Okay, fix the data. Now I'm just gonna make sure that I got everything in there correctly. Okay, looks good. Now I wanna move over to list three and type in my weaker hand data. So 28, 14, 27, 18, 17, 26, and 16. 
Okay, so I have now those seven students with their dominant hand in list two and their weaker hand in list three. Now here's something cool you can do. Now you'll notice that I kept list one blank. Move your cursor all the way to the top of list one and now it gives you this list one equals. What I can do is I can click the second button and two. Now it says list one is equal to list two and I'm gonna click minus and I'm making sure I'm clicking the minus key above the uh, addition key. And then I'm gonna click second and three. And this takes all the values in list two and all the values in list three and subtracts them and puts them in list one. Now I can see that most of my values are positive, which means that I'm going to have a right tail um, where I'm gonna shade on the right tail, even though this is a two tail test. I'm going to make sure it gets entered in as a not equal to problem, but you see how most of my numbers are positive versus negative. I also kind of come up here and went um, second three minus second two, and you can see that most of the numbers are negative instead of positive. But I kind of like the first one better. So let me move up to the top of list one and do what I did in the first place, second two minus second two three because the second key moves to this upper row above the keys one two and three and all of them so it just subtracts all of these here okay so now I have subtracted um, the dominant minus the weaker which was the big minus the small and in step one the really the order doesn't matter okay the order does not matter mm-hmm so it didn't matter which way, and the reason why is because we have a not equal to problem. Now step two, we can't assume normality. And the reason why we can't assume normality is because it wasn't stated in the problem. So what we're gonna do is we're going to do an outlier check. And we're gonna do an outlier check in list one. So outlier check for list one. Now to do that, you have to kind of remind yourself of something we did way back in the second unit. The stat, we're gonna to move to the right and we're gonna click on the first option, which is our one variable statistics. And the calculator considers list one to be that default option. So if you click stat, you click to the right, the calc menu, and you click on the one, now you're in the one variable statistics. Let's move down to calculate since we want list one and the frequency of that list is fine. Now, what we need from this is we need the Q1 and the Q3. So by pushing the arrow key down, we can see the Q1 and the Q3. The Q1 is zero and the Q3 is seven. So the first quartile of the differences is zero and the third quartile of the differences is seven. So let's uh, clear that out and let's write this down here. So what we have is the Q3, which is seven, and the Q1, which is zero. This means my IQR, which is Q3 minus Q1, uh, that is an answer of seven. Now to do the outlier check, we're gonna take the third quartile and add the IQR times 1.5. And we're gonna see if there's any differences bigger than that number. And then we're gonna do the Q1 minus the IQR times 1.5 and see if there's any number that's lower than this number. Well, the Q3 is seven, and the IQR is also seven times 1.5, and this makes an answer of 17.5. Did we have any differences that were bigger than 17.5? And the answer was no. And since we didn't have anything bigger than 17.5, then there's no outliers in the upper end. Now what we have in Q1, this is zero. Zero minus seven times 1.5 which gives us negative 10.5. Did we have any differences smaller than 10.5? We didn't, our smallest difference was um, like negative, negative one here. So again, we don't have any problems there. Therefore, no outliers. And since no outliers, we now can assume normality. Since no outliers, since not, excuse me, since no outliers, we can assume norm normality, which means we can use the t-tests in steps three, four, and five. All right, let's get back to our calculator here. Turn our calculator on. 
noticing that we have everything we need in our list one. If we go stat, if we go to our tests, and we go down to the, the T test, we then have our data in list one. Mu, uh, our null hypothesis is still set to zero, which is what we want, but we want two tail this time, and we want this to be drawn. So let's go see what this looks like. We got a nice two tail test being rendered on the screen. Our T value is two standard deviations away from the norm, 2.1844 to be exact, and our P value is 7.16%. All right, so here we have our beautiful T curve, which gives us, gives us, gave us this T value of 2.1844 and a P value of 0.0716. So we got a shaded section here and a shaded section here, and we're gonna plant our flag at 2.18 standard deviations away from the norm, the norm being that there's no difference between either hand. Okay, so what we have is the probability or the p-value of landing in this section. So if you added up the shaded zone here and the shaded zone here, that would be 7%, which is an unlikely event, but is it rare? All right, here's my alpha. My alpha is 0.05. Here's my p-value, 0.0716. Oh, so close, but since my p-value is greater than this, since p is greater than q, sorry, greater than alpha, <laughs> don't know why I said q, p is greater than alpha, we do not have sufficient evidence, whoops, bad spelling here, evidence to reject the null hypothesis. R-E-G-J-E-C-T, the null hypothesis. Okay, yeah, I mean, you got a you got a very unlikely event, but it wasn't small. The p-value was not small enough to reject the null hypothesis. Now, is there a way that you could change something to make it so we do reject the null hypothesis? Like, is there a fiendishly statistical way we could get it to change the null hypothesis? To basically reject it because we don't have we, we do not reject the null hypothesis here but what if we change the alpha to 10 percent well now the p-value would be lower than the alpha and we would have to reject another way we could do this is if we could go to one tail if we went to let's say since these are positive values let's say on the calculator instead of doing a t-test that was not equal to what if we chose a t-test that was greater than oh what does that do when i go to draw well what it does is it puts the shaded section on one side and in doing so the shaded section is now look the p-value smaller uh oh so now the p-value is smaller so by changing this from a two-tail test to a one-tail test now we can also reject the null hypothesis Ooh, how how sinister. But that, my friends, is how you should maybe look at data when it's very close to being rejected. There might be something going on. It just may not have been statistically big enough, but then what you do is just run more tests. Whenever you get really close to your alpha, but not big enough or small enough to reject or not reject, you just run more tests because you want to see if... Um, if uh, with a bigger sample size that you can uh, maybe make some different assumptions about the null hypothesis here. Well, thank you for finishing this chapter with me and I wish you luck on reviewing for the exam. And if you have questions, always email me in class and thank you again for watching.